Okay, the next item of business is debate on motion 6779 in the name of Hamza Youssef on improving care and services for people uh, with chronic pain. Uh, I would uh, invite any members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Uh, I call on Marie Todd to speak to move the motion. Uh, Minister, for around 30 minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I welcome today's opportunity to discuss our commitment to supporting the health and well-being of people in Scotland living with chronic pain. We can all experience pain as part of our body's normal response to injury or illness, but when pain lasts beyond the normal expected healing time or has no identifiable underlying cause, some people experience chronic pain. Clinically, Chronic pain is pain that persists or recurs for longer than three months, and in the UK it is estimated that somewhere between 20 to 50 per cent of adults are affected at some point. While some people may be able to access specific treatment which helps to restore their quality of life, for example a joint replacement, it is estimated that around 5 per cent of the population in Scotland are living with severe chronic pain, which adversely affects all aspects of their lives. When we talk about chronic pain, especially for this group facing the greatest challenges, we must remember that everyone's experience of pain is unique and that people need support which addresses their individual needs. I've met with people with chronic pain who've told me how distressing this condition can be, but also how, with the right information and support, they have regained control of their lives and improved their quality of life. However, I know that many do not feel that they have access to the support they need, which is why we published the Framework for Pain Management Service Delivery Implementation Plan in July. This plan sets out priorities for improvement of care and services, which have been informed by people with chronic pain and the actions that we will take to support people with pain to live well. The framework was developed through extensive engagement with people with chronic pain, our services, clinicians and the third sector, including public consultation on a draft of the framework. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in these activities and shared their priorities, which have been used to inform the implementation plan. The implementation plan has 18 actions centred around the four aims of the framework. These are person-centred care, accessible care, safe and effective care and improving care and services. Now, given the varying impact that chronic pain has on general health and well-being, Different people require different levels of support tailored to their own unique circumstances. That's why person-centred care is one of the aims of our framework. We have set out actions which will deliver more consistent advice, improve the understanding of pain and its impact amongst our healthcare workforce and promote local holistic support for the wider impact of chronic pain on people's well-being. We've heard from people with chronic pain how challenging it can be to find clear and consistent information. In response, we've established a national expert working group that's dedicated to overseeing the improvement and coordination of information and resources at the national and local level. Our starting point for this work will be a user needs assessment where people with chronic pain can tell us exactly what they need from national resources such as NHS Inform. This will ensure that we deliver more useful and appropriate national advice about chronic pain, better information on the steps people can take to manage its impact and how they can access further support and services when needed. People with chronic pain are already experts on their condition. But we know many benefit from additional supported self-management offered by our partners in the third sector. And our framework is establishing a dedicated third sector network to improve partnership working with our public services so that people with chronic pain can access a greater range of options for support. For example, Pain Association Scotland 
delivers building resilience sessions to empower people with chronic pain to self-manage their condition as part of their care. This Certainly. Jackie Bailey. I, I welcome the input of the voluntary sector, and it's so important in terms of self-management. Um, but obviously, people are keen to know what resources are attached to this implementation plan. Try as we might, we can't find the detail of that. Minister. So this year, we've already invested over £700,000 in direct support of pain management services and the improvements that we've set out in the plan. That includes support for the Scottish National Residential Pain Management Programme and the clinical leadership required to deliver the plan and improvement activity. And that's on top of the 425000 that we've invested since 2020 in additional support for health boards, third sector and other partners to deliver new projects and enhance support for people with chronic pain through the Modernising Patient Pathways Programme, Local Improvement Work and the Pain Management Winter Support Fund. Furthermore, our budget for health and social care this year will deliver a record £18 billion for services, including increases for community and primary care health services, where the vast majority of people with chronic pain are seen and managed. If I can go back to the third sector um, organisations, the project from the Pain Association Scotland, alongside other work delivered by the charity, received funding of just under £40,000 from Scottish Government's Chronic Pain Winter Support Fund earlier this year. And a person who was supported um, by this initiative, who has chronic pain, reported, the course and supporting information has made me feel seen, heard and understood in a way nobody has ever done before. You really helped me to deal with the impact of my condition and the puzzle of my chronic pain. People with chronic pain have also told us they face challenges accessing local services when they need them. The impact that this has on their well-being and the missed opportunities for earlier and more effective intervention. Our framework includes an aim on accessible care with specific actions on how to improve to improve how local and national services are delivered to provide a more coordinated and consistent experience. We'll do this by sharing best practice, promoting innovative new approaches to service delivery and improving how services understand the needs of their local populations. For example, the report was published today on the initial findings of our pain management panel highlights that access to support in primary care settings is a priority for people with chronic pain. For many, this is often the only place that they turn to for help to manage their condition. This supports the approach that we've taken to date to improve how specialist pain services work in partnership and share expertise with primary care colleagues. Since 2020, we've provided over 180,000 through the Modernising Patient Pathways Programme, as stated, to develop new models of care that support people with chronic pain in their communities. An example of this would be specialist pain pharmacists and nurse practitioners working together with GPs and NHS Ayrshire and Arran to improve their skills in supporting patients with chronic pain. Following this project, patients reported improved emotional well-being and greater confidence in managing their pain. There is also a reduction in the number of appointments for chronic pain and GPs demonstrated safer and improved prescribing for pain management. A patient who benefited from that project reported, over the past few weeks, I have increased my dog walking, um, I have resumed outdoor bowling and I feel confident meeting up with family and friends all achieved by controlling my own pain management confidently. As well as improving community-based care, we know that we need to improve access to specialist pain services, which were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm incredibly grateful for the efforts of our dedicated pain workforce to recover and remobilise these services and the latest data shows almost 80% of people with chronic pain were seen for their first appointment with an hour 18-week referral to treatment target. However, certainly. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Minister for taking an intervention. Can the Minister set out how many follow-up appointments were met within the target and what timescales people had to wait for that? Because that is certainly not the experience of the constituents that are coming to me saying that they're waiting for weeks and weeks and in some cases months and years for intervention. Minister. 
So I know that there's a challenge with identifying the follow-up appointments in terms of the data that's collected. And one of the commitments in the framework is to improve the quality of data that's collected so that it's robust and re reliable and we can get a better picture of exactly those issues that you're talking about right now. We're, we're aware of that gap and we are absolutely determined to get the appropriate data in order that we can tackle that problem. I mean... <coughs> We do know that people face long waits. We are taking action through our framework to work with pain service managers to improve those pathways into specialist care. This includes improving referrals and access to the Scottish National Pain Residential Pain Management Project, which provides the highest level of care for people with chronic pain. And it's funded by Scottish Government to the value of approximately £500,000 each year. We're also testing new digital options to offer greater choice to people with chronic pain on how they engage with their care. Safe and effective support for people with chronic pain is essential, and our framework aim around this will deliver improved outcomes from pain management services by promoting sustainable delivery of effective evidence-based care. Expert working groups are working towards this by reviewing national guidance and promoting safer, more appropriate use of medication as part of pain management strategies. They are also identifying opportunities to improve the consistency and delivery of specialist interventions for chronic pain. The final aim in our framework focuses on improving services to deliver a better experience and outcomes for people with chronic pain. The report we published today from our lived experience pain management panel and the responses to our public consultation on the draft framework have highlighted that improved professional knowledge of chronic pain is a key priority to improve the experiences of people with chronic pain. To do this, we've already established a new national multidisciplinary pain education group. They've developed a comprehensive knowledge and skills framework for healthcare professionals at all levels and in all settings. This and other training improvement resources will soon be available in a new pain management knowledge hub hosted by NHS Education Scotland. And that will provide a one-stop shop for our public and third sector workforce to drive improvement and consistency in pain management training across our services. We also acknowledge the need to provide the staffing levels and the workforce required to deliver pain management support and services. And our framework has reiterated the commitment set out in our health and social care national workforce strategy with work underway to progress future training programmes. These will support the development of the pain management workforce at both the specialist and non-specialist levels. So today I have spoken about how the Scottish Government will begin to address the impact of chronic pain across Scotland through the clear and realistic actions outlined in our implementation plan. We are committed to rapidly improving care and services for people with chronic pain. To do this, we are establishing a dynamic approach, including a new governance structure and shifting focus to building delivery capacity. New working groups are being created, some of which are already operational to bring together policy, clinical and service expertise at the national level. The approach is fundamentally informed by the diverse voices of lived experience, including our pain management panel and local views gathered by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. In closing, presiding officer, I'd like to reiterate my own personal commitment and that of this government to continue to listen, to learn and to act to make sure that every person with chronic pain is able to access safe, effective and person-centred support to help them to manage their condition and to live well with pain. I move the motion in Hamza Yousaf's name. Thank you very much. Indeed, Minister, can I advise the Chamber that we have no time in hand and therefore I'm going to have to um, uh, ask all members to stick to their speaking allocations or even undercut it um, if that is possible. Any interventions will need to be accommodated in your speech allocation. With that, I call Sandish uh, Gulhani to speak to and move Amendment 677.9.2 for up to nine minutes. Dr Gulhani. Thank you and I move the motion in my name. I want to describe a situation that many of us have experienced. I'd like you to imagine it, and it's dental pain. The pain often comes on suddenly, it's often sharp and intense, and then accompanied by an aching or throbbing sensation. The throbbing can develop into extreme debilitating pain, leaving us feel sick. It takes over our waking thoughts, our mental capacity, our ability to function. We feel helpless, exasperated. Just make this pain go away. 
And once we're treated by a dentist, in most cases, this is precisely what happens. The pain goes. Now, think about being in constant pain forever. Not dental pain, but really significant, debilitating, chronic pain. Think about getting through each waking hour and the deterioration in mental health. Think about the one in five people across Scotland who live with chronic pain impacting their lives every single day. And let's also think about the SNP government's decision to cut 400 million from the NHS's frontline budget. And in a typical day in GP surgery, I spend around 80 minutes talking with patients about their chronic pain. And I spend even more time on their related mental health problems. Chronic or persistent pain is defined as pain that carries on for longer than 12 weeks despite medication or treatment. Chronic pain can persist after an injury or operation, but also affects people with diabetes, arthritis, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, and back pain, to name a few. And now we can add long COVID to the list of conditions that can inflict long-term chronic pain. That's why more than a year ago, when 90,000 Scots were suffering with long COVID, I called on the Cabinet Secretary for Health to establish multi-speciality long COVID clinics to care for these patients. Now, over 200,000 Scots are struggling with long COVID. But other than some spending announcement, we're still waiting to hear about any specific actions to support these people. Let's also remember that... Yes, I will. Thank, thank you for giving way. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, he can speak for his own area, but it's an area I've been following up with uh, Forth Valley. And I'm pleased to report I have seen evidence of specific actions they're taking to support long COVID in my constituency. And he, he might want to chat with me so that I can pass that information on to him. Dr Gulhani. I'd be happy to. Uh, but what I'm calling for is a long COVID network of clinics, because that is the way that we're really going to get treatment and help to the patients who are suffering from long COVID. And that is what they're asking for across Scotland. Let's also remember that it can be very difficult for chronic pain sufferers to function in the workplace. In turn, this impacts their family finances. And with one in five Scots living with chronic pain, the Scottish economy suffers too. But for now, let's stay focused on the patient. The problem right now for chronic pain sufferers is poor access to treatment in order to reduce the debilitating impact on their daily lives. Almost 4,000 people are waiting for their first appointment at a chronic pain clinic. Only 26% of patients are seen by a chronic pain specialist within six weeks. In the quarter ending 30th of June 22, 20% were waiting 10 to 12 weeks. Now, it's vital that everyone here in Parliament and at home understands that these patients have been seen by their GP. They're on significant painkillers such as cocodamol, tramadol, or even morphine, and are still in intractable pain. This is not the toothache I described at the start of my speech. This is significant chronic pain. As for those patients with musculoskeletal conditions, Scotland versus Arthritis reports that over 42,000 people are waiting for joint replacement surgery, a list which is anticipated to grow over the coming months. Presiding officer, Scotland has a chronic pain crisis. It is indeed a public health crisis. And while the Scottish Government published in July a framework for pain management service delivery implementation plan, it is underwhelming. There are four laudable aims, though. Patient-centred care, access to care, safe and effective support to live well with chronic pain, and improving services. But the plan does little to outline how it will be implemented or explain how patients will access services or, indeed, any detail on staffing, investment or involvement of patients. The plan provides little in the way of confidence that sufferers of chronic pain will experience any improvement soon. Does the Cabinet Secretary expect Scotland's shrinking GP workforce with its shrinking budget to deliver? The Scottish Government says it's thinking to improve care and services and is being taken in partnership with people with chronic pain. This would indeed be the correct way forward. The trouble is we are hearing a different story. According to Dorothy Grace Elder, Voluntary Secretary of the Scottish Parliamentary Cross-Party Group on Chronic Pain, there has been no proper partnership with patient representatives on the Government's National Advisory Committee on Chronic Pain. This committee is closed to the public, stacked with health board officials and civil servants, and supervised by the Alliance, which is funded by the Scottish Government to the tune of around six million a year. 
these patient reps were promised equality and co-production, sharing facts and documents, but co-production did not happen, with access to documents and facts refused. They were barred from seeing the framework document on chronic pain services before it was printed, and six months later sent a printed report marked draft with no opportunity to comment. Ms Elder's account is disturbing. We have a multi-million pound taxpayer funded organisation versus sufferers of chronic pain. Whose interests are being represented here? Although appointed for two years, patient reps were dropped after four months and just two meetings. A Freedom of Information request also reveals that the Scottish Government officials and the Alliance have discussed by email that patient reps should be told to stop communicating with each other unless in meetings supervised by the Alliance. Now, there's an old expression, and it goes, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it is a duck. Well, this certainly looks as if the Alliance, supposedly a patient voice organisation, is taking advice from the Scottish Government on how to control the narrative. A Sunday Post article quoted the Alliance as saying it is not subject to instruction from civil servants, while the Scottish Government says it did not request restrictions on members. Emails sent on the 24th and 25th of May 2021 suggest otherwise. Members of Scottish Parliament cross-party group and chronic pain usually pack the gallery during debates of interest to the group. Presiding officer, the CPG are upset about the timing of today's debate. Its members find the lack of notice cruelly excludes patients with disabilities who need time to plan and often require to be accompanied. We call on the Scottish Government to recognise that far too many patients have attempted suicide over extensive delays in physical waiting times. Gross understaffing in pain-related mental health has not been addressed for years. Pain causes job loss, family breakups, poverty and deep depression. Pain suicide risk should be fully included in the Scottish Government's suicide prevention plans. Patients are also worried that the Scottish Government wants to reduce reliance on chronic pain services and certain treatments and increase self-management of pain. The Scottish Conservatives believe the NHS Scotland should develop access to new specialist services, which might include regional one-stop injections and infusion clinics to help reduce waiting times and improve follow-up appointments for patients. Our patients suffering with chronic pain are desperate, and we have a duty to come up with solutions, not woolly words. I spoke about the one-stop injections. Minister, let me give you another solution. Where there is spare capacity and surgeons are not in theatre due to a lack of beds and delayed discharge, then why not use that capacity for trained surgeons to administer pain-relieving injections for people who can be waiting up to 12 months? This is day case surgery and does not require beds. I draw members to my member of interest as a registered GP. Thank you, Dr. Gulhani. I now call on Jackie Bill. And I call Jackie Bailey to speak to move the amendment 6779.1 for up to seven minutes, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Let me welcome the opportunity provided to debate this issue. The Cross-Party Group on Chronic Pain has been calling for the Scottish Government to bring forward a debate on chronic pain for some time now. So let me take this opportunity to acknowledge their hard work over the years with former MSP Dorothy Grace Elder continuing to champion their cause. There are difficult issues to discuss. There is a lack of trust from some patients about the Scottish Government's intentions and actions. Some people with lived experience have been excluded from these discussions before by the Scottish Government, and we must ensure that that doesn't happen again. Now, the Scottish Government set up the National Advisory Committee on Chronic Pain way back in 2017, but seven out of the 10 elected patient representatives quit the committee as they felt that their voices were not being heard and they were somehow simply part of a tick box exercise. The Cabinet Secretary promised to meet with patients, but he's cancelled meetings at least three times. Um, but he did meet with the cross-party group conveners, and I am grateful for the work that Monica Lennon, Miles Briggs and Rona Mackay do for those with chronic pain. Now, I don't want to dwell on these particular incidents, but I would make the observation that successive governments have made promises about patients' voices being at the heart of shaping policy. And that's right. That lived experience, though, should not be dismissed if those voices are challenging and don't fit with the government's preferred narrative. Let me turn to chronic pain services and the framework for pain management service delivery implementation plan. The broad approach that recognises the context of 
living with chronic pain is helpful, the impact on employment, the impact on family life. But the pace of change suggested in the plan is much too slow. Services are currently patchy, they're not enough staff, and we need to move more quickly to support the hardworking staff in this field, as well as improving things for patients. Try as I might, I don't really see um, the commitment to funding to help deliver the change required, but I'm delighted that the Minister, in response to an intervention, told the Chamber about the resources that are attached to the plan. But I would ask, are they new? Are they specifically attached to particular actions in the plan? And will she publish the detail of that financial support so we can have transparency about how change will be delivered as existing staffing and resources are already overstretched? Let me illustrate the challenge with the latest figures released by Public Health Scotland. 1,835 patients seen at a consultant-led chronic pain clinic during the last quarter. Now that's great, but when compared to 2,122 in the previous quarter, that's a de decrease of 13.5%. At the same time, just shy of 4,000 patients were waiting for their first appointment at a chronic pain clinic. Now that figure has increased by 20.9% in just three months in this year, but it's almost 50% higher than the number that were waiting last year. And whilst first appointments are measured against an 18-week waiting time, um, there are no such waiting standards, no time limits for return patients, and many have waited over a year for that treatment. Now, I believe the government acknowledged that further work is required here, and I hope that the Minister can agree to Scottish Labour's call for greater transparency around waiting times for follow-up treatment. Let me also address the issue of self-management. If we can give people the tools to help themselves and provide opportunities for self-management, then that is a good thing if it works for patients and is deemed appropriate by their doctors. But access to specialist services must remain in place, not least for those living with the most serious conditions, but also to review those who are more able to self-manage them. Removing them is not an option. And there have been concerns raised that patients have been forced into unsuitable self-management pathways, which has also resulted in increased pressure on primary care services and indeed on many voluntary sector providers too. GPs, as we know, are already struggling to cope with the increased volume of patients that they are seeing. Stripping away money from the sustainability fund for them and 65 million stripped away from the primary care improvement fund will simply add to that pressure. So I would appreciate a reassurance from the minister that specialist services will not be reduced as a result of the implementation plan and that the burden will not fall on GPs or indeed fall on the voluntary sector. I remember that it used to be the case that patients were sent from Scotland to Bath for some specialist services. I understand more recently, patients have had to travel to Doncaster to get pain relieving treatment. The more that can be provided by the government in Scotland, the better. And I hope the minister will address that. Presiding officer, there is undoubtedly similarity here to many other areas of healthcare at the moment. Waiting times are increasing. There's not enough staff and those we have are under pressure and under-resourced. And patients are getting sicker before they are seen and before they are treated. Now, I've no doubt that the pandemic has exacerbated the situation, but this was a problem before the pandemic began. Figures show... Uh, happy to do so. Minister, briefly. Just, just to be clear that on data and waiting time numbers, the, the numbers that are waiting to see, be seen are actually lower than before the pandemic, and there's been a 77% decrease in the number of patients waiting the longest time at 52 weeks. I'm sure the member will welcome that. I, I always welcome good news, but let me share with her figures that I have that show that chronic pain waiting times were just as bad before COVID-19 as they are now. 23% of people were waiting more than 18 weeks for a first appointment at the end of December 2019. Comparatively, now, 17.9% were waiting over 25 weeks in June this year. So the problem hasn't really gone away. And let me, this sums it up for me, Ian Simmons, who runs the charity Action on Pain and is also a patient representative, had this to say. It's fair to say that chronic pain services in Scotland are in the worst state in the whole of the UK at the moment. Let's listen to patients. Let's turn the situation around. 
If it needs investment, let's deliver that. But we need transparency of data so we can establish the scale of the need for improvement. And we need self-management services alongside specialist services and not as a substitute for them. Presiding officer, chronic pain is debilitating. Access to services is critical. The government need to get a move on, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Ms Bailey. I now call like Cole Hamilton uh, for up to six minutes, Mr Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I offer apologies for my brief absence from the Chamber during opening remarks. I had to attend a call from my son's school. Um, I'm pleased to speak in today's uh, debate, and can I echo Jackie Bailey's gratitude to the government? We have been calling for this debate for quite some time, because it, it's incredibly important, and it's perhaps long overdue. Um, chron chronic pain is, as we've heard, a hidden condition. It affects 800,000 people in Scotland. 800,000 people. That's around one in five Scots. So it can be a result, uh, or rather, it can result in significant suffering for both those affected and those around them. Those suffering describe it as a marathon that you can't you can, where you can never reach the finish line. And the impact of this debilitating condition has serious ramifications. Studies have found that highly persistent chronic um, pain is associated with poor mental health, poorer general health, even joblessness. And yet, despite all of that, and despite four nationally commissioned reports in the last 10 years, chronic pain is still not even recognized as an official condition. For far too long, thousands of Scots suffering chronic pain every day have been badly let down. Have a read of the report by Healthcare Improvement Scotland and you'll be troubled by what you find. We have heard some of that today. It looked at the provision of adult chronic pain services across primary, secondary and tertiary care in each NHS board area. It found provision across the country to be, and I quote, patchy and fragmented with access to services varying considerably between and even sometimes within NHS territorial boards with very few health boards having dedicated funding streams available for chronic pain services. Both healthcare professionals and service users describe a significant discrepancy between the descriptions of available services and the service that is actually provided. In fact, no health board could provide an accurate description of the chronic pain services that they provide or of the resources available to fund them. Presiding officer, if you'll permit me, I'll come on to the government's pain management implementation plan, which is sadly lacking in detail and leaves many questions unanswered. There is no clarity on how services are to be improved, very little on staffing and a great lack of detail on investment. The government say that they have collaborated with people with chronic pain in developing this plan. However, members of this parliament's cross-party group on chronic pain have a very different story to tell. And we've heard some of that already. They say there has been no proper partnership. Ten patient reps elected to a closed government committee describe being ignored, silenced, repeatedly denied meetings with the cabinet secretary or with health ministers. They say it did not improve the original report or the implementation, or sorry, they didn't approve the original report or the implementation plan. And some of them even describe the motions for, uh, for today's debate and as I quote, vague spin, which could be twisted into anything. That's a damning indictment from the very people who desperately need the government to take action to improve chronic pain services across this country and hardly the seal of approval that it has suggested. Presiding officer, I also want to recognise the importance of pain clinics within our local services, which offer a wide range of treatments and support, um, support to relieve symptoms of chronic pain, such as from arthritis, back problems and, of course, nerve damage. These services are under real strain. There is little capacity and a lack of skilled professionals needed to carry out these services. I know that my colleague, Lynn MacArthur's constituency of Orkney, um, it, the, the local pain clinic there, has had to recently co close, causing a serious knock-on impact for those reliant on its regular service. And while efforts are underway to provisionally fulfil that service by other health boards on the mainland, it highlights the need for more targeted support, both to maintain their provision and to identify gaps in their service in their advance. Important also is the availability of specialist services. In 2020, the First Minister's governance report stated her government's plans to reduce reliance on chronic pain specialist services and increase self-management. That came as a real blow to many severe sufferers who credit, it, uh, who credit specialists with that life-saving help. And for some, it is life-saving. Two years on and patients are still awaiting clarity about which treatments may be cut.
The government's nonchalant attitude to health will sadly come as no surprise to the almost 200,000 Scots currently suffering from long COVID. And let's not forget the real link between chronic pain and long COVID, because it is one of the symptoms that many, many of the sufferers face. The government is devoting twice as much money to it in its efforts to break up the UK in a referendum next year as they are in helping long COVID sufferers. That is shameful. Presiding officer, we need to revolutionise our approach both to long COVID and to chronic pain. To the government's plans and their whole approach leave much to be desired. Thousands of Scots are waiting in pain and they need more than just lip service. They need local, specialised targeted care and it is up to this government to provide it to them. I, we are being watched in this chamber this afternoon. This debate has been a long time coming and it is long overdue. Let us not meet that challenge with lip service. Let's meet it with real action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cole Hamilton. We will now move to the open debate. I would remind speakers that there is no time in hand and therefore uh, the acceptance of interventions must be absorbed within their speaking time. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Finlay Carson. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be speaking in this much-needed debate on chronic pain. And I hope today's debate will benefit patients dealing with this terrible, life-diminishing condition. As a co-convener of the Cross Party in Chronic Pain for the last six years, I'm very aware of the daily struggles people face while trying to cope. So many harrowing stories of very personal difficulties, frustration and physical pain, often leading to mental pain and suicide attempts. Presiding officer, today we will hear that there are long-standing issues surrounding the pathways for chronic pain treatment. I say long-standing because they do go back a long way, in fact, since the inception of this parliament. One person who knows this all too well is the Group Secretariat, Dorothy Grace Elder. For 20 years, Dorothy Grace has selflessly devoted her time, and very often her own money, to helping patients in the group. She's more than an administrator, she's a friend and a passionate supporter to so many in the group. Her work, along with her ever-supportive husband, George, is simply beyond compare, and I thank and applaud them both on behalf of the conveners and, I'm sure, the entire group. Presiding officer, there is no doubt there has been historic problems with communication and inclusivity between the NHS and government uh, over the years. The, those have not been easy. This has not been easy to bear for patients who are already struggling with their conditions. And there's also been a postcode lottery among health boards when accessing chronic pain treatment. But, presiding officer, I believe we must now look forward and work together for the benefits of the many patients throughout Scotland. It's estimated that 800,000 people, that's one in five patients throughout Scotland, suffer from chronic pain. I'd say that figure is the tip of the iceberg, but data collection has been sadly lacking. In its 2021 programme for government, the Scottish Government made a commitment to developing a new framework for pain management services, as we've heard the Minister outline. Uh, this plan was published in July 2022 and sets out the actions planned to improve care and services for people with chronic pain across Scotland. It sets out new governance arrangements which are intended to improve coordination, engagement and the pace of action to improve care and services for people with chronic pain. This includes a network of third sector organisations supporting those living with chronic pain uh, with representation on the Pain Management Task Force and approaches to engagement that ensures a range of lived experience informs how actions are delivered. Presiding officer, lived experience is crucial to any ongoing framework for pain management, and there has been criticism of this from the, within the CPG about exclusion, not inclusion. But as we've heard, the government has consulted with the wider pain community throughout Scotland for the pain management, through the pain management panel. The pain management panel is designed to support people with chronic pain to discuss and feedback issues, make proposals and ask questions to inform implementation and delivery of the framework. It has been commissioned via an independent organisation, The Lines Between, and includes people with chronic pain who have not previously had the opportunity to be involved in the Scottish Government's work. An initial report on the outputs of the panel will be published shortly. However, I think it's important to highlight key patient requests from our cross-party group, which is always extremely well attended. And before COVID, people travelled across the length and breadth of the country, often in extreme pain, to attend the CPG. First and foremost, a key request is the protection of specialist chronic pain services, and this includes infusions and injections for those needing it in the correct timescale. 
One of the issues patients have flagged up is the delay in getting follow-up treatment. And we, we've heard this from previous speakers. It's absolutely crucial to a pain patient. The nature of chronic pain clearly means that one appointment will not be enough. One patient and member of the group who requires an annual injection has been waiting years in the past and has spoken publicly about their experience. This is why data on return patient waiting times is vital and has an, until now been sadly lacking. There is no limit on return patients waiting time, un, unlike new patients who have a statutory 18 week waiting time, um, which we heard the Minister uh, say that 80% you know, of people referred uh, as new patients were seen within that time. Um, presiding officer, unacceptable waiting times existed long before COVID, but the pandemic has exacerbated the problem, as in many other areas of the NHS. Specialist staffing is a huge problem, and I hope that more emphasis is put on this uh, area of medicine during the training of medical students as they consider their career pathways. Um, I'm pleased to hear the Minister set out um, plans for this. I also hope we can consider alternative ways of treating chronic pain patients, possibly with vaccination centres similar to the ones set up for COVID and flu jags, because I do think we've got to the stage when an alternative thinking to address the historic problems patient, patients have been dealing with is very necessary, and with a renewed focus in the framework, feasible ideas on all areas should be proposed. So, in conclusion, preside, presiding officer, no amount of words will ease the pain for the many people living with this condition. We need action and cooperative working with lived experience patients to help us deliver what they need when they need it. It is the very least they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call Finlay Carson to be followed by Bob Doris. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Carson. Thank you, President Officer. We all have, of course, experienced pain, suffering or discomfort at some point in our lives. But thankfully for most of us, it doesn't last long. And after a couple of paracetamol, we normally back, bounce back to normal. But we are the lucky ones. For many, that pain can persist and carry on for months and months, regardless of medication or treatment. Chronic pain, as we know, affects one in five people across Scotland with significant and serious impacts on their daily life. One in 20 people have been diagnosed as suffering from chronic pain, a condition that many, uh, according to the World Health Organization, leave contemplating taking their lives. The untold misery that it inflicts on many people's daily lives is both horrendous and alarming, to say the least. In many cases, chronic pain can persist after a, an injury or an operation. It also affects people with a range of medical ailments, including diabetes, arthritis, irritable bowel syndrome, and back conditions. Worrying, worryingly, the number of cases expected to rise further as a result of working from home as more and more people are being signed off sick with back and neck problems. Official figures by the Office of National Statistics have revealed a surge in the number of people dropping out of the labour market as a direct result of using inappropriate work equipment. The ONS stats reveal an epidemic of chronic back and neck problems which are being linked to working from home. And a spokesman said it is impossible uh, it's, sorry, it's, it's possible that increased home working since the pandemic has given rise to these kind of chronic conditions. It's known that almost one in five people are still working from home in Scotland, despite the COVID restrictions having been lifted. And the already alarming figures that show almost 4,000 chronic pain patients are currently waiting on their first appointment at a chronic pain clinic. That could be about to increase further, which is a major worry considering the overstretched resources within our NHS. Indeed, the situation has become so bad that many chronic pain sufferers are now forced to seek treatment in England because of the long waiting times in Scotland. Currently, it should be pointed out that only 26 per cent of patients are seen by a chronic pain specialist within six weeks. In the quarter ending June 2022, the stats show that 26.2 per cent of patients are waiting 79 weeks, with more than a fifth waiting between 10 and 12 weeks. I think we all should agree that, that, given the circumstances, this is clearly unacceptable and measures must be introduced to significantly bring down these waiting times. Some chronic pain sufferers are waiting three years for pain-relieving injections. Liz Barry, a former nurse, described the current chronic pain stats as a sham, as the data published only covers people waiting for initial chronic pain clinic appointments. She said, and I quote, what is being hidden is utterly outrageous at the amount of time thousands of patients are then forced to wait for follow-up injections. The publication of the Framework for Pain Management Service Delivery Implementation Plan aims to improve care and service being taken in partnership with people with chronic pain, NHS staff and services, including the third sector and other key stakeholders. 
On the face of it, it sounds like a positive step forward if, of course, greater resources are provided to ensure this actually happens. However, critics of the framework insist there was no proper, proper partnership with people with chronic pain, having been denied sight of facts and documents relating to it. As touched on by my colleague Sandish Galhani, Dorothy Grace Elder, the Voluntary Secretary of the Scottish Parliament's Cross-Party Group on Chronic Pain, insists that the new framework is absurdly vague waffle, and the fear is that the Scottish Government may slip through reducing specialist services and piling more on GPs who are already uh, toiling. I would hope the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister will provide assurances today that this will not be the case. Patients are desperate to ensure that specialist chronic pain clinics are maintained and staffed adequately. In September 2020, the First Minister's governance statement declared her government wanted to reduce resilience on specialist chronic pain services and certain treatments and increase self-management. But two years on, we're still waiting to hear which treatments may be cut. It should be remembered that many depend, for instance, on lignocaine infusions and pain relief injections recommended by specialist doctors, and thus must be protected. Different NHS health boards across Scotland address the issues of chronic pain in different ways. In my own, con own constituency, NHS Dumfries and Galloway, they set up a chronic pain team in 2017 within the anaesthetic department at Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary. And all patients with chronic pain are offered an initial education meeting to discuss their condition, after which they're referred to the appropriate further treatment. This, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't have time. Uh, this may include treatment from a specialist physiotherapist, a specialist pain consultant or a physiologist. Some patients uh, may see one of all the specialists over a period of time. Indeed, there is current, currently work underway to ensure that the primary care have good pathways in place to support these patients within the community settings, including, I hope, utilising our community hospital and cottage hospitals within my con constituency. Presiding officer, establishing a framework is one thing, but we really need to be clear on the fine details such as staffing and investment if we are to seriously make an impact on chronic pain services in the future. Thank you, Mr Carson. I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, up to six minutes, please, Mr Doris. Presiding officer, it is a pleasure to, to speak in this afternoon's debate. In starting, let me acknowledge the fundamental challenges in the provision of chronic pain services in Scotland. I think across the, the parties, there is an absolute agreement on that. But there's also opportunities. And having read the new framework for pain management, which has been produced by the Scottish Government, uh, I thought it was considered, I thought it was strategic, I thought it was coordinated, uh, it looked to me to be integrated, and potentially, and the word potential is in a lot of heavy lifting here, potentially innovative. But of course, it also has to be implemented. Much of the debate has been been about that, I, I think. And, and I welcome the very first action action within the delivery plan and it's to establish a national expert working group to oversee coordination and development of chronic pain information and, and resources. And crucially, those with lived experience of chronic pain are directly and will be directly involved in that. And of course, I should acknowledge there's been some discussion this afternoon about how we make sure we capture that direct lived experience in a meaningful way and other members have put on the record where they have concerns in relation to that and I would acknowledge that. And we need to be open about pressures and resources across the public sector. And we absolutely need to map it out, identify and address local and regional variations in that resource and service delivery in relation to chronic pain. We then need to address that variation of resource and service delivery. And I would welcome more details from the Scottish Government, from the Minister, about how we would set about tackling that. For instance, will the learning from this work be connected to Action 6 within the strategy? which will establish a national expert working group to identify and scale up improved pain service planning and delivery. A connection between implementing a strategy document and identifiable delivery and change on the ground is obviously important. With between 30 to 50 per cent of people estimated to suffer some form of chronic pain and 5 per cent of people in Scotland reporting severe disabling chronic pain, which adversely affects all aspects of their lives, that variation clearly needs to be addressed. And I mentioned resources, and the most important resource are the patients who know their pain best, of course, but also our healthcare professionals who do their level best to offer support as best they can. And that is why I also welcome the action to establish a chronic pain knowledge hub for healthcare professionals to promote understanding and learning on chronic pain. Healthcare professionals offering support locally won't always have all the answers, but their colleagues elsewhere across Scotland 
may have. We need to share the expertise. I therefore commend the Knowledge Hub, but would stress that it needs to be easy to access for healthcare professionals, and they need to have the time to refer to the Hub to use it. I would also ask whether the Hub will allow for healthcare professionals to interact directly with each other to offer peer advice and support about how that can be facilitated rather than just an online portal. I was pleased to see that within the strategy there was a clear appreciation of the greater strain on pain management caused by the substantial waiting list for various NHS procedures, including orthopaedics, which gets a specific mention within the strategy. Now, I know NHS waiting lists have been a, a key debate in this Parliament, and it has been politically sensitive. So let me say, from my point of view, that I acknowledge that the NHS in Scotland, in many ways, it is outperforming colleagues in NHS England and Wales. But we still have a heck of a lot to do. We have to do better here in Scotland as well. And I absolutely welcome the focus and drive of the Health Secretary in seeking to do so. However, that does not wash away the reality of individual patient experiences of chronic and persistent pain as they face extended waits for surgery. It was therefore important to see in the strategy that the Scottish Government is considering how pain management support can be integrated as part of the pre- and post-operative care pathways. And I met a constituent just the other day who has waited around a year for an orthopaedic procedure, and that wait is likely to go on for, for a fair bit yet, unfortunately. Their ongoing pain, understandably, impacts on their quality of life and it is impacting on their employment. They need their surgery, but they also need support for chronic pain, pain exacerbated by their lengthy wait. Given reducing its surgical waiting times is an ongoing challenge right, right across the UK, presiding officer, it is important to ensure that we embed support for chronic pain management and support into service offered to those patients facing those <coughs> long waits. And my understanding is that is what this strategy is seeking to do, and I would welcome further details on how it can seek to achieve that. In the case of my constituents, say their GPs sought to be supportive in relation to pain management and re referrals to physiotherapy, hopefully has been helpful to a degree, but clearly they need their, they need their surgery. That, that, that's just a, a, a reality. Uh, the, the strategy talks a lot about specialist services, and I would, I, I would draw Parliament's attention to Action 8 in the delivery plan, which says establish NHS pain service manager networks to improve coordination and planning of specialist services. Who could disagree with that? We absolutely have to do that. Um, but of course, we also have to, where possible, promote pain self-management. It shouldn't be one or the other. It should be a commitment to both. And I just put that on the record there. But of course, what a specialist service looks like may change over time, but that has to be evidence-based and it has to take the, the patient and chronic pain community with them. Finally, presiding officer, at the start, I said I thought the strategy was considered, strategic, coordinated, integrated and potentially innovative. It also has to be monitored for delivery on the ground. So I would welcome more details on how that is achieved, but hugely ambitious and I am hugely supportive. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Doris. I now call Monica Lennon to be followed by Christine Graham. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Lennon. Thank you, presiding officer. I have the privilege of being a convener of the cross-party group on chronic pain alongside Rona Mackay and Miles Briggs. And like them, them, I too am grateful to our Force of Nature volunteer secretariat, Dorothy Grace Elder, and to all CPG members, past and present, for their invaluable contributions. Colleagues may know that the group was established back in 2001. And it has always challenged this Parliament and the Scottish Government to improve the lives of people living with chronic pain. And that robust challenge and scrutiny is needed now more than ever. A debate in Scottish Government time focused on the practical steps that will be taken to reduce waiting times, to improve patient pathways and to tackle the real issues affecting the workforce is long overdue and indeed welcome. I am slightly disappointed that the Cabinet Secretary is not here today. I know he has been engaging keenly with colleagues, um, but hopefully um, he will be made aware of what is discussed today. The issues around... Certainly. Minister. So, as members will understand, the Cabinet Secretary is spending at this moment in time every waking moment trying to resolve the issues that are facing our 
NHS in terms of potential strike action. He's very apologetic that he can't be here and he's certainly watched the debate with interest. I'm sure that opposition members would be the first to criticise where he not dedicating all his time to resolving that issue. Monica Lennon. Thank you. I think we're all keen to make the most of the time in the Chamber to, uh, today. So we know that the, the long delays, the postcode lottery that, that colleagues have mentioned, these are issues that, that predate COVID-19 and certainly predate um, Ms Todd's time in office as well. So the implementation plan, I think we all have to, to welcome that. But like colleagues have raised, you know, reasonably like Bob Doris, we just need to test this out and make sure that it will work. Because as colleagues have said today many times, this is affecting one in five people in Scotland. That is 800,000 people. And we do recognise that not everyone's experience will be the same. Everyone's needs will differ and the spectrum of pain in terms of, you know, those with the most severe pain, that, that will differ as well. But unfortunately, what we do know, what brings our pain community together is the, the long waits for care and treatment. We know it's unacceptable. In my region of central Scotland, I know through my own um, casework and freedom of information request that there are patients who have waited in excess of three and four years for steroid injections when the recommended treatment time is, is 18 weeks. We have um, constituents who are supposed to get the injection six months apart and they've waited years and some have had to go private when they can't afford to do that. So we know it's exacerbating health inequalities right across Scotland. And as colleagues have said and is in the, the Labour amendment today, this is not just a process issue to, get, to gather numbers for the sake of it. The data collection for those patients who require ongoing care and follow-up appointments is really, really important. First of all, it gives people a rough idea when they might expect to get an appointment so they can plan their life and plan holidays, annual leave, special occasions and so on. But also it allows us as a parliament to scrutinise the workforce plan to make sure that we're putting resources into the right places. So I think it's um, action six in, in the document uh, that talks about data. It, it's fine, but I would say, Minister, it's quite vague. So I, I hope in closing we get a firm commitment um, that brings us closer to what patients are actually asking for. And not just patients, it's for the workforce as, as well. Um, Finlay Carson mentioned Liz Barry. Liz lives in East Kilbride, is a former nurse, a constituent of mine. Um, she's no stranger to, to the Parliament because she has been very outspoken because Liz is very courageous. I think because she comes from healthcare, she feels even more passionately about it. Um, and just a content warning here, because colleagues have talked about the impact on mental health. To quote Liz directly, she says, I have contemplated suicide and overdose on pills in the past because the situation is so bad. That, that is not unique, um, but that is one example I'll leave with colleagues today. Others have said to me, you wouldn't expect a family pet to have to wait two years for pain relief. So why are our constituents having to wait years? Like Liz, a former nurse herself, and so many others who've literally had to beg, borrow and steal to get the funds for private treatment. In the pandemic, because chronic pain was completely shut down in, in many respects and was one of the last services to be remobilised, we did have patients, including my constituents in Lanarkshire, travelling to Doncaster because they were in unbearable pain and agony and some were feeling suicidal. They went to England, they paid for their own treatment, they paid for travel, they paid for accommodation. Previous health ministers said that they could probably get that money back. Well, they haven't received a penny. It's not fair, and I hope that the government will still try and um, address that. I know time is, is short. A couple of things. Self-management has been talked about and is important. But when people are given leaflets and told to go and walk their dog or do a bit more exercise, we have to remember that that is not appropriate for everyone. We have to avoid being ableist here. What about people with disabilities who can't do those things? People who don't have the income to do some of the, the activities that are recommended. I also feel this disproportionately impacts on women. So Ms Todd also has responsibility for the Women's Health Plan. Endometriosis, a chronic pain condition, eight and a half years on average for a diagnosis. The government's got a brilliant commitment on that. But again, we need to know there is a plan to bring that, that time down. Um, so I just want to end by saying, you know, um, chronic pain can be debilitating, but add into the mix 
COVID and the impact of that, add in cost of living crisis, and if you live in Lanarkshire, our health board is in a code black. So we need to give people hope, not through our warm words, but through the action. And I agree with colleagues, the implementation plan, lots of good stuff, but we need the resource to make sure it's so, going to work. We need you, the data, and I'll end on that thank note. You. Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First, may I send my regards and best wishes to my former colleague, Dorothy Grace Elder, who has campaigned without pause on the issue of chronic pain since at least 1999. But I'll start on a personal note. Like over 19 per cent of the Scottish population, and I suspect this is an underestimate, not the Scottish Government's fault, I have chronic lower back pain. Some days it is worse than others, but it's always there and has been for some years now. Sitting at my computer during COVID made it worse, referred to by Finlay Carson, and one day my back simply froze and I had to take bed rest. I've mentioned it to my GP, but was told simply to take painkillers, which I do and carry with me always. I self-medicate like many others, and in fact, they have now become more essential than my reading glasses. This is nothing compared to the level of pain other people have day in, day out. But it has given me a taste of what it must be like to be in severe constant pain without relief. You wake up and take for granted that there will be pain. It affects every aspect of movement, walking, housework and so on. Gardening, always a pleasure, takes its toll and movement is restricted. You adapt to what you can and can't do. Standing is painful, so even as I speak, my back is painful. It affects personal relationships. Fortunately, now living the single life, only the cat has to hear the constant refrain, oh, my back. That said, it can also affect the family unit, partners, sometimes supportive, sometimes impatient. Who wants to hear someone always complaining? We therefore need to have more spaces for those with chronic pain to talk to each other, knowing that those listening are in the same boat. It all helps and may take some pressure of those living with those who have chronic pain. For so many, it's far worse than for me. And the key message, and I know the Scottish Government is approaching this in the right way, is that treatment, management, availability must be directed by those who suffer chronic pain in all its varying forms. It must also, in any delivery, be person-focused, because each one suffers differently, each handles the pain differently, both physically, mentally and emotionally. For some, of course, they simply lose their employment. For them, there are financial consequences. I note, too, that training for NH staff is to be increased, which I welcome. Actually, I would extend this to GPs and their staff. Some doctors, receptionists, acting as gamekeepers are not always sympathetic. And before I get a lot of emails about this, I say some. In preparation for this debate, I had a look at the online help. And I have to say, when I went on to NHS 24 self-help guide, it doesn't do what it says in the tin. After ticking the various boxes in the online questionnaire, it simply told me there's nothing seriously wrong with your back. Well, that wasn't any help. A better website was NHS self-management, which had exercises to help with lower back pain. Now, I confess till this debate, I hadn't looked at that, and I'll try some of the exercises. So, what I have to say is that if I didn't know about it, I think a lot of the public aren't aware of it. Can I suggest a public information campaign to let those people like me with back pain what might just help by way of these exercises? It's worth a try. In the meantime, I suggest to others, as I say they do it, I'd also want to focus on early intervention and to encourage those who are silent about their chronic pain to identify themselves. Because, as we know, that adapting I refer to may very well lead to further deterioration in both physical and mental well-being. It passes the pain buck to other parts of your body, your legs, your neck. So while I welcome the plan, I want actual delivery on the ground. That's the test, both at national level and, I know the, and at local level. And I note the Minister's response to Jackie Bailey on resource allocation. It's in the interest of all. Those suffering, many in silence, their families, those who live with them in society at large, that this is dealt with. Plans are the easy bit. The test, of course, is in making life that bit easier for those with chronic pain Whatever the level, I put myself at a very low level compared to others. I know the Minister recognises that, but that will be the test. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms Graham. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by CoCab Stewart. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As many others have said today, chronic pain encompasses a wide range of conditions, some with well-known progression and treatment options, others who have little predictability and some way to go in terms of specific treatments being developed. All have a huge impact on the person experiencing the pain, as well as their loved ones and carers. Chronic pain affects as many as a third of the population, with one in ten experiencing high-impact pain. Most chronic pain is caused by musculoskeletal conditions. About eight in every ten people with chronic pain report that at least some of their chronic pain is in the neck or shoulder, back, limbs or extremities. The impact of chronic pain is unequal and unfair. A recent versus arthritis report has shown that certain groups in our society, such as people who live in deprived areas, some from minority groups, such as ethnic groups, and women or older people experience greater life stress, disadvantage and discrimination and are more likely to have chronic pain. The versus arthritis report also said that improved parity with other long-term health conditions needed to be achieved. This debate today is important to both press for the best possible services for those with chronic pain, but also to ensure that we have a medical and social culture that treats pain seriously and does not dismiss or diminish chronic pain as something everyone gets. I would like to commend the work of Versus Arthritis, the Pain Association and the Cross Party Group on Chronic Pain for their work and advocacy on this issue. I wanted to share the story of a friend's journey of chronic pain following an assault. Again, here I want to advocate for shared patient records to ensure that no one has to continue to repeat their story and describe their mechanism of injury. Following the assault, they were assessed by maxillofacial surgeons and it was concluded that a nerve in their face was damaged. As a result, they often had issues with pain, a loss of control and numbness in that side of their face. For trigeminal neuralgia, which is what they were diagnosed with, treatment options were limited. Either take surgery to completely sever that nerve, risking more complications, or take anticonvulsant medication to try to stop the pain. Anticonvulsants have a number of side effects, requiring you to be careful with alcohol consumption and even eating things like grapefruit. For a young woman, constant pain, numbness and difficulty controlling one side of their face was bad enough. But for that to have lifestyle impacts and implications was, had, was adding insult to injury. There was no pain clinic referral to talk about other options or offers to trial other medication. And we need to improve this, not just for those who experience chronic pain as a result of trauma, but as many others have said, for those with back pain, joint pain and chronic pain caused by conditions such as endometriosis. I believe there also needs to be good mental health support for those with chronic pain. There are some days where the pain is manageable. There are days where the frustration and stress is all-consuming. Sometimes for my friend, their trigeminal neuralgia feels like their eyes on fire and is a constant reminder of that assault. Experiencing chronic pain, whether as part of musculoskeletal conditions, nerve pain or idiopathic pain, changes the way you have to deal with your day-to-day -day life. For some whose condition may be progressive, the stress and mental toll this takes cannot be underestimated and is often in itself a traumatising experience. We need to ensure that those with chronic pain can get the help they need to navigate their diagnosis. For many chronic pain sufferers, stress has the potential to flare up their condition and we need to make sure that patients have the right tools and support to, man to be able to manage stress as well as possible to prevent exacerbating their condition. I wanted to focus some of the end of my con contribution on how we ensure those with idiopathic pain are treated with the same compassion and care as those who have obvious mechanisms for their pain. As I said earlier, and as anyone with chronic pain here will know, it is far too easy for people to say to get over it, to take some paracetamol or to return to the old chestnut of everyone gets a bit sore sometimes. For those with idiopathic pain, there is the added complication of not feeling believed because there is no obvious cause to their pain. It's no less sore than anyone else, it's no less debilitating, and it's exhausting to be, to be put through test after test to rule out conditions, to be left with no more answers and treatment options that are not always entirely suitable. Further research into idiopathic pain presentations is needed, and patient voices need to be heard to ensure that services reflect what these sufferers need. 
The Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland website have an important reflection on their website about chronic pain. Chronic pain is one of the potential conditions people can suffer in the aftermath of a stroke and has various presentations. Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland recommend that chronic pain sufferers know what their pain feels like, how it manifests and take a note if you need to. Depending on where and how your pain presents, we still need to know when our body is telling us something is wrong. And knowing your pain could be very important depending on where and when it occurs. Presiding officer, chronic pain can affect any one of us in our lives. The effects can be debilitating, further impact on our wider health and the ability to do the basic thing of enjoying our lives. Our healthcare professionals are doing one, a wonderful job by address, addressing the root causes of pain. As we have done with other forms of healthcare, we are becoming more person-centred, but we need to continue to listen to those experiencing pain and build upon their experiences. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call CoCab Stewart to be followed by Miles Briggs. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Stewart. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate marking another step forward in the delivery of health and care services which understand and support people with chronic pain. And I've listened very carefully um, to the very informative contributions from uh, the members in the Chamber, especially to Christine Graham's. Chronic pain is defined as a pain that persists beyond normal injury healing time and reoccurs for longer than three months. It's a separate condition in its own right and frequently presents alongside other long-term health conditions. And it's often said that living with chronic pain is hard, but dealing with those who don't care or understand can be even harder. Lived experience tells us that older people represent a significant proportion of those with chronic pain and it's sometimes responded to with an uncharacteristic lack of empathy from healthcare professionals, leading to poor investigation and little or no therapeutic intervention. We know that chronic pain is complex and unique to every single individual. But as people age and present with chronic pain, we hear reports of their experience of accessing local health care services being one that is less than compassionate and lacking in empathy. Unusually for the caring professions, an older person approaching their GP for advice, guidance, treatment options can find the response to be based on assumptions and inevitability, a response that blames old age itself rather than focusing on what aspects of the ageing process might be causing chronic pain and how best to treat and alleviate the patient's experience of that pain. Moreover, there is evidence to indicate that there are links between adverse experiences and the incidence that impact of pain. So when an elderly person goes to see their GP for advice and support and meets with a response which doesn't acknowledge or engage their experience partially, uh, potentially, I beg your pardon, the impact of their pain can be intensified. Indeed, a key finding of the framework we are debating today is that people with chronic pain feel that the lack of recognition of its impact on their everyday life, including from health care professionals, increases the challenges they face. Like the rest of the population, the debilitating effect of unmanaged chronic pain reduces the quality of life and the well-being of older people. The act plan notes an approach to care that prioritises empathy and kindness in order for it to be effective. And I really like that these words are explicitly included in the action plan. Everyone living with chronic pain has a right to expect such an approach when they approach the NHS for care. I hope that when the plan talks of drawing on the expertise of people with lived experience of chronic pain, that this will include older people. The voices need to be inclu included in the development of training for health professionals. Therapeutic touch is confirmed by an increasing body of scientific research and practical evidence as of huge potential in reducing the impact of pain. And I hope that the toolkit for healthcare professionals can reflect treatment options such as uh, that are appropriate for older people, including physiotherapy, massage and other bodywork therapies. 
It is almost impossible to underestimate the importance of ensuring that health and care workers, including GPs and their team members, have an understanding of the challenges of living with persistent pain to ensure that they provide informed and compassionate care and to enable them to signpost older patients to appropriate accessible um, treatments. I welcome the fact that the first aim of the implementation plan we are debating today is person-centred care, and the actions identified to deliver this include developing a knowledge hub and a pain-informed toolkit for healthcare professionals to promote in all care uh, settings. Identifying existing um, best practice already being delivered and establishing how the principles of trauma-informed practice can be incorporated as part of pain management care and support services is also a valuable element of the way forward. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I welcome today's debate and the commitments made in the Action Plan, fostering an approach based on compassion empathy and respect is the right thing to do. I hope that the work that follows will lead to a significant improvement in the experience of accessing NHS services for all those living with chronic pain, including our valued elderly population. Thank you, Ms Stewart. I now call Miles Briggs to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Up to six minutes, please. Thank, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I want to start also by paying tribute to the work of members of our cross-party group on chronic pain over the last 23 years, and specifically to remember those who are no longer with us as well. Um, I know she will hate the amount of praise which she has received today, but Dorothy Grace Elder really does have to be commended for everything that she's done to support patients in what is sometimes the most difficult circumstances anyone could imagine. Um, and I also want to thank and pay tribute to my fellow uh, co-conveners, Monica Lennon and Rona Mackay, because over the last six years, what we have des desperately been trying to do is just to make some progress for patients. And I don't think it is unfair to say that access to chronic pain services in Scotland has been totally unacceptable for too long. We need to see reform and we need a new approach. And I genuinely, genuinely hope that today can present the start of a process that will deliver change for chronic pain patients across Scotland. A Scotland versus arthritis briefing for today's debate states, chronic pain is a public health crisis. And I agree. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, Jackie Bailey stated that politicians are quite quick to talk about listening to people and lived experience and deliver and delivering patient-centred care. But for one group of patients in Scotland, which this has clearly not been the case, it is chronic pain patients across this country. I can honestly say that listening to patient stories who attend our cross-party group has presented some of the most challenging and harrowing conversations I've had in my time, the six years I've been an MSP. When someone living in such pain thinks that contemplating suicide is the only option they feel is available to them, that should act as a major wake-up call to all of us, but especially politicians who have direct responsibility for our NHS. Sadly, and I'm sure my fellow conveners would um, back this up, that seems to be the experience of so many of our fellow Scots who are living in pain every waking hour of every day. That's why I do desperately hope this debate is an opportunity for the government to listen to these concerns and fundamentally to start work at fixing services people rely on. Now, we've heard a lot of statistics today in terms of people waiting for services, um, but I want to highlight specifically where I am concerned that we are seeing a movement towards self-management being what will be offered. Um, and I don't think that's acceptable and something we should look towards because what we have seen in some of the reductions has been introductions of new pathways that offer patients alternatives to being seen by a consultant-led outpatient clinic, but then they are removed from waiting lists if they take up that offer. That is just creating more hidden waiting lists, in my view, within our health service. And the suggestion which I've been put forward, uh, putting forward for some time now is what's included in our, in our amendment today, and that is a call on NHS Scotland to develop a new pa patient access um, for, for specific um, regional clinics so that we can actually drive forward 
um, action on waiting time. So patients can look towards accessing injections and infusions on a regional basis in clinics to help reduce waiting times and improve follow-up appointments. And I think a similar model to what we've just seen around the pandemic for vaccinations would work in delivering for our uh, constituents. Um, specifically, there's been many issues which have been touched upon today, which I hope um, the Minister has, has taken on board. Um, during the pandemic, we have seen um, reports that one in ten Scots were being prescribed powerful opioids it, to, purely to deal with the chronic pain that they are living in. Now, I know from con conversations I've had with my own constituents that they feel they're now addicted to these opioids and indeed self-prescribing has become the norm or only option available to them with people resorting to online purchasing of drugs uh, to manage their pain. That is a hidden part of this crisis I don't think we've discussed today, uh, but we need to see also recognised. Now, the Scottish Government's framework for pain management services can and must present that opportunity to resolve all these issues and improve access to services. And that will take leadership from the Minister, from the Cabinet Secretary and every um, local health board as well. Challenging range staffing remains a significant part of that, and we need to see a workforce plan for chronic pain uh, services. Um, I also think self-management is important, but can never be just an excuse for withdrawal, withdrawal of uh, pain services. And I believe there's also two areas um, which this debate has also been helpful around. Christine Graham made this point very well in terms of what work can be done to provide that peer support group. Um, I led a debate a couple of weeks ago with regards to the cancer card model, which is providing that online support, bringing all cancer services um, together. Now, I think we, it is about time that we saw that for chronic pain patients. And so how the hub will develop that, I think, is useful. And I hope, um, as Bob Doris made a number of good points around as well, that we will see um, that organically developed by patients as well, so that they are at the heart of, of this. Now, the Minister also stated, in every single case, this is individuals' experiences living with chronic pain. And that cannot be underestimated. I think that's important. And therefore, access to mental health support is also something which hasn't been looked at enough either. Because for many people, that initial chronic pain as it uh, presents then leaves them in a situation where poor mental well-being uh, happens very quickly, deteriorating uh, whilst they wait for any access to any services. So to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, today must be the start of a process. And I hope the Minister and Cabinet Secretary will take personal responsibility for how the framework for pain management service delivery will now be implemented. It is clear that we need this, this implementation plan to be explained to patients. How will they access services? What specific detail will be provided on staffing, investment, and ultimately always the involvement of patients? As Alex Cole Hamilton said, chronic pain patients across Scotland are watching today and we must see the Scottish Government deliver the change we need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Briggs. I now call Pam Duncan-Glancy to be followed by Emma Roddick. Uh, up to six minutes, please, Ms Duncan-Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. Musculoskeletal conditions and chronic pain are one of the most common long-standing illnesses in Scotland. Over 29% of the population, 1.5 million people, have one, I myself included. So before I say anything else, I want to put on the record my sincere thanks to all the incredible NHS staff for the support they have given me throughout my life and which they provide me now. Doctors, rheumatologists, nurses, podiatrists, physios and more, many of whom I see weekly. All of you know who you are. I also want to thank the third sector organisations and the cross-party groups on arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions and on chronic pain for their work to raise awareness of these conditions and for representing the views of people living with them. Living in chronic pain is constant, pervasive, tiring, distracting and sometimes depressing. It often means a strong cocktail of painkillers, some self-care for those of us who listen to our own advice and often medical care interventions. All of these are essential. Miss out on one when you need it, and it can all get too much. Living in pain is like having a whole other job, with many moving parts to it. You must plan for it, anticipate it, take time work off work for it, and often work around it. Things can all get overwhelming. I'm not exaggerating when I say there are days when I can't see through the pain. Keeping going, especially in this job, is sometimes the only option, but that comes at a cost. I make choices every day about how to manage my pain and my time, and it can be tiring. 
These decisions take up time and energy, but like the millions of other people in Scotland in pain today, I make those decisions and move on. When pain is managed, though, the need for these considerations is reduced, and that gives us space to think about the job we're doing and the things we want to do and the people we want to spend our time with. Addressing chronic pain is not just necessary to end suffering. It's necessary to help free up the brains and minds of those of us living with it so that we can contribute to society and lead an ordinary life. That's why I'm not just disappointed that services to help people living in chronic pain are on their knees. I'm angry. By letting this crisis continue for as long as it has, with no signs that it's ending, this government has let staff and patients down, and the crisis has gone on far, far too long. Last June, 3,853 patients were waiting for their first appointment at a chronic pain clinic. That's a 20.9% increase since March this year, and a 46.9% increase since June 2021. People in chronic pain in Scotland are being left in agony for years, missing out on essential interventions. Many who need regular injections, as my colleague Monica Lennon has said, haven't had them, and others don't know what will work because they're stuck in a cycle of gatekeeping and barriers that see them nowhere near finding solutions that will work for them. Some people lose their jobs, some can no longer go out as much as they used to, they lose friends, relationships change, as my colleague Christine Graham said, and so do habits and hobbies. As someone who believes that people know their own body, I believe self-management is important, and we on these benches welcome the new framework. But I say to the government that this cannot come at the expense of any other intervention. People cannot move on without vital support. But instead of being seen, they're being asked to follow programmes of self-management that are often inappropriate, as Jackie Bailey has, con has already said. Help for their pain is seen as elective, like people have a choice, so waiting is fine. They're deprioritised, sent to the end of the list with a checklist of things they can do to help themselves. And they're left like this for years. Presiding officer, when waiting times are in years, not months, can this government really argue that any other interventions are actually available? A right to health care that never comes is effectively no right at all. The experience of one of my Glasgow constituents lays all of this bare. Despite, despite explaining that his pain is so debilitating that he's having to give up some work, is becoming increasingly disabled, has had to give up things he used to enjoy and had to cancel trips out with friends, he's waited over two years for essential pain treatment. He's been on and off waiting lists, passed from department to department, told he wasn't a priority, and even then that the wait he, the wait he had wasn't as long as he thought it was because of the trickery with numbers that meant his repeat appointments weren't being recorded. I raised this with the Cabinet Secretary last year, and I asked that targets and reporting be changed so that they reflected real-life experiences, not clever counting, hiding years of pain. I'd appreciate a commitment again to addressing this in the closing remarks from the Government today. My constituent eventually got a cancellation and was asked to attend at short notice. He got there and was met with worn-out and stressed staff. He was told that one exhausted nurse, that by one exhausted nurse that the clinic had been cancelled several times. The system is working for no one, patients or staff alike. To add insult to injury, he was then told he would to schedule his own appointments via a phone number that was never answered. So I asked the Minister, is he to conclude anything other than the process itself is designed to gatekeep? Let me reiterate, presiding officer, living in chronic pain is a full-time job. The last thing patients need is having to do an admin job too. It is really self-management in the extreme. My constituent is angry. He misses his activity that he used to do. He's frustrated because he waits and waits, is waiting for answers. And like many people living in degenerative chronic pain, he is constantly re readjusting mentally and physically to a new normal or worry about what the next new normal will look like. The government have claimed, of course, that people, the experience of people like my constituent is because of COVID. But this situation is not new. It is the result of an understaffed and under-resourced NHS that went into the pandemic fighting for its life while being tasked to fight for ours. The resilience of my constituent is remarkable, as is often the case with people living in chronic pain. However, his life, as many people's is, is unrecognisable. He's lost work and missed opportunities as a result of spending days on end fighting. And he's not alone. Every one of us in this chamber has a story like his. The SNP must step up and take action. They must work with patients to sort this and improve treatment and wellbeing. They must protect specialist chronic pain services, give them the support they need to do their job, provide greater transparency around waiting times for return patients, and end the needless system of passing the burden of admin to patients. The government can't take pain away, but they can certainly take action to stop adding to it. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. I now call Emma Roddick, who will be the last speaker uh, in the open debate before I ask uh, the winding up uh, statements to be made. Uh, uh, Emma Roddick, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It can be very difficult to access services for chronic pain, and my own experience is that it has often been particularly hard to be taken seriously by some healthcare professionals if you are a woman. Uh, a situation acknowledged by the Minister's very welcome Women's Health Plan, and which I think is important to keep in mind throughout this debate. For multiple conditions, I've had to access emergency care because the pain got so bad, only to be told, well, that just happens. And the brush-offs as I grew up went from it's growing pains to, well, that's what every woman has to go through, to, well, it's probably mainly your mental illness. The last one is one that I know from chats with disabled people's groups is particularly insidious. Chronic pain is very hard to live with. People who have chronic pain and don't already have a mental illness as well will often develop one due to the pain. To then struggle more to get your pain acknowledged and treated because of mental health issues adds insult to injury. The focus the Scottish, Scottish Government has put on providing specific training on chronic pain and its impact is very good, both in the framework and in the Minister's contribution earlier. It can be hard when you're in the position of dealing with a healthcare professional who doesn't understand your condition not to feel as though it's personal and that they don't care, but of course they do. Many simply don't know how to manage someone's chronic pain or tell the difference between a drug seeker and someone who actually needs the good, strong drugs to function. Giving healthcare providers clear guidance and pathways on dealing with someone who has chronic pain and knows what treatment, help and support they need is vital. Improving advice to those with chronic pain to allow better patient-led choices is also great if it works. But as many disabled people know, informing yourself about your needs and options can be a double-edged sword. Most of the people I know with pain-related disabilities needed advocacy and peer support to, to get a diagnosis and treatment. It's very rare that I hear of somebody going to their GP, being referred to a specialist service, being diagnosed and then successfully having their chronic pain managed without a need to fight. And I'm going to give special mention here to the SNP's Disabled Members Group, uh, an incredible collection of people and me who are disabled SNP members. I had the pleasure of chairing their AGM last month and I always leave the meetings with a great sense of hope because disabled people, whether it's physical, mental or invisible disability or neurodivergence, often have to form these groups. It can be exhausting to fight every day for adjustments all on your own. But if you do join these disability forums and groups and educate yourself, find out about your illness, arm yourself with all that information, you're often not met with understanding and a new willingness to give you the treatment that you've asked for, but rather suspicion. As the Minister said earlier, people with chronic pain are already experts in their condition, but making that clear to doctors can actually harm you. Doctors often pull back at this point, suggest paracetamol in a walk, or accuse you of consulting Dr Google a bit too much. But that is what people have to do. I met recently with some people involved in various EDS groups, uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, for those unfamiliar. EDS very often comes with chronic pain. I myself have hypermobility. I get awful migraines and what feels like toothache in my joints, as well as frequent soft tissue injuries and inflammation. But there's still a lack of understanding of what causes the pain and what makes it worse. At the meeting, we discussed cases where EDS patients were referred to physio treatments that made them worse. And it's clear to me that clear pathways are needed, and I'm glad to see reference to this in the framework for chronic pain in general, though I will follow up more specifically with the Minister on the point for diagnoses like EDS, which often come with chronic pain. I am concerned, like Labour, about self-management that is prescribed inappropriately or without the needed concurrent medical support for people suffering severe and chronic pain. Self-management is often really helpful, and I recognise the many benefits that it brings in freeing up other resources, but we have to make sure that people who need medical intervention don't feel like they're being fobbed off. I was lucky to get this diagnosis of hypermobility as a kid after a few rugby injuries, but it wasn't until very recently, through reaching out to people online, that I understood fully what the diagnosis was and what it meant for me long term. In a very bad pain period at the end of last year, I went to my GP begging for help. I got physio and was put on a course of paracetamol and ibuprofen to take multiple times throughout the day. 
which badly upset my liver. My physio got suspended until those symptoms went away and I was left in a lot of pain and completely stuck. I couldn't come down here, I couldn't do my job properly and I couldn't live my life. It was only after a hospital admission that I got painkillers which would actually work and help me back on my feet, physio and support in developing an exercise routine, all of which are allowing me to walk around the building this week. This is not that unusual and the worst stories that I've heard from constituents come from those who were on pain management that worked but then got removed by their doctor. Afa Sayre wrote to MSPs yesterday on this very point, asking the Scottish Government to ensure that clinicians in Scotland stop forced withdrawal of opiates from chronic pain sufferers. And I appreciate this is a very nuanced issue. There are real issues to consider in terms of controlled drugs, addiction, overprescribing. But these drugs do have their place. And if somebody needs them in order to be able to live their life and control their chronic debilitating pain, then that's exactly what they were designed for. So I hope that the Scottish Government can provide some reassurance to patients in that situation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Roddick. I now call, uh, move to closing speeches. I call Paul O'Kane uh, to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. Around six minutes, please, Mr O'Kane. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I think we can all agree that it's important this debate was brought to the Chamber today because it is clear that chronic pain is a public health crisis deserving of time and attention in this place and it demands, of course, the focus of the government. Indeed, as we have heard today from many speakers, the cross-party group on chronic pain has been calling for this debate for some time now. And of course, we should, as has been done by colleagues, acknowledge uh, the work of the cross-party group, and in particular, uh, Dorothy Grace Elder and the co-conveners, all of whom contributed uh, today to the debate. Because the cross-party group has been the place where very often all the concerns we've heard today have been raised, have been articulated, and have been explored, and much more than that, I think, as we've heard quite clearly today, has acted as something of a support group uh, for people who find themselves experiencing chronic pain, perhaps for the first time, indeed, in their life. Uh, Presiding officer, if the new framework is to truly deliver meaningful improvement for people living with chronic pain, um, then it must go further uh, and must be underpinned by clear investment. Indeed, if it does deliver the improvements we all seek to see, we will give the government credit. But it is clear that there are people who feel that it could fall short of the mark. We must see investment to match the aspiration. Uh, and we do acknowledge the Minister's contribution uh, in regards to her, what Jackie Bailey raised with her. And I do hope that she will maybe say more on that in her uh, concluding. Because the reality is that thousands of people have waited uh, unacceptable amounts of time to have their first appointment at a chronic pain clinic. And we have heard about the challenges on availability of, chronic pain, of pain clinics across the country. Um, I think today we've heard from colleagues across the chamber about the issues that exist in their communities and the issues that people have experienced in relation to getting the treatment that they need. Indeed, Monica Lennon and Finlay Carson raised the issues that have been experienced by people like Les Barry, uh, particularly in terms of access to medication and pain management injections, and right through, I think, most importantly, to um, the mental health uh, issues that are experienced by people and the poor mental health that's very, that goes hand in hand with chronic pain. And I thought um, the contribution relating to Liz was very powerful in that regard. And indeed, Versus Arthritis has shared with each of us a briefing for today's debate that has, I think, highlighted the way that people feel, uh, the desperation that people feel very often when waiting for updates on their treatment or access to treatment uh, in chronic pain. I think that sense of not knowing, not having information and not being able to um, get on with your life, I, I think is hugely challenging and deeply concerning. Um, the, the government have said that they are grateful for the time that respondents to, took to contribute to the consultation that informed the framework. But I think it is fair to say that we have heard and we are hearing people voice concerns that they haven't been listened to enough. And it is clear that a consultation can't just be about listening to some people's views, uh, reflecting on them and then, then acting without them. Because as we've heard from Alex Cole Hamilton, from Jackie Bailey, uh, from Pam Duncan Glancy, from Miles Briggs and others, this is absolutely about people being at the heart 
and people being at the heart of influencing this framework, uh, scrutinising this framework and driving it forward. Because we know that lived experience has to be at the heart of everything that we do. And I really do think we've heard some really powerful um, contributions in that regard. People who have bravely, colleagues, spoken about their own experiences, Panda and Glancy, Emma Roddick, uh, Christine Graham, uh, and others. And I think it's important that we reflect that that's also the story of our constituents, that they want to be able to share their experience, and that experience, uh, they want to see that experience reflected in the framework. So the Scottish Government should be working in partnership with patients, putting them at the heart of the design of services and using their experiences to inform the best way forward. And I would reflect that we have to do that in terms of new and emerging issues like long COVID. And I think it was important that Alex Cole Hamilton brought that issue to the Chamber again, because very often people who are experiencing long COVID aren't believed, um, they aren't given the right information, um, they are dismissed. And I think we've heard that not just about long COVID, but about many issues associated with chronic pain today. Um, certainly. Alex Cole Hamilton. I am very grateful, uh, Presiding Officer, for Paul O'Kane giving way to my intervention. Does he agree with me that, along with that stigma of disbelief, sometimes comes a tangible problem of actually having the condition recognised in medical records, and particularly long COVID long haulers who had it at a time we were not testing for COVID are facing that very problem? Paul O'Kane. Yes, absolutely. I would agree with Alec Cole Hamilton in that regard and, and would highlight the work that's been done uh, in the cross party group on long COVID to bring some of these issues to the fore. And I do hope the Minister will have time to respond to that issue in her summing up. Um, Alternative pathways, presiding officer, for people with chronic pain are to be welcomed. Indeed, any solution which can offer people relief and respite is welcomed. And indeed, I thought Rona Mackay's contribution in that regard was particularly important, that we have to look outside the box, we have to um, think about different avenues, and we have to learn from um, the COVID pandemic about how we might use some of the innovations that we experienced then to make things better. And indeed, Miles Briggs, I think, highlighted that in his contribution as well. I will briefly turn to workforce, because I am conscious, presiding officer, of time. We know there are workforce shortages uh, affecting delivery of chronic pain treatment. We know there are issues, and we have heard issues this afternoon, about access to specialist doctors and um, advanced nurse practitioners. We also know about the issues um, around allied health professionals, who play an important part in the delivery of services. Yet workforce data shows that there are over, for example, 346 whole-time equivalent physiotherapy places vacant. So we do need to uh, work to get those vacancies filled and to expand the workforce so that there are people available to provide the support that is required. I think we had um, important contributions today on the balance between specialist services and self-management. I thought Bob Doris's contribution was particularly important in that regard. He said it isn't about one or the other. I think he is right. And I think that was highlighted by Pam Duncan Glancy. People can't be left just to their own and, and be pushed to the bottom of a list. There has to be specialist services along with good high quality inputs in terms of self-management. So, uh, to conclude, presiding officer, people in chronic pain cannot wait. Uh, the Scottish Government must listen most carefully to those people who are suffering with chronic pain and deliver services that offer relief and help to improve quality of life. And that is the yardstick by which we on these benches will judge progress on the Government's plan. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Tess White. Thank you, presiding officer. <clears throat> it's likely that Every single one of us in this chamber today knows someone who suffers from chronic pain, or perhaps even suffers from it personally. Paul O'Kane outlined the important work of the Chronic Pain CPG as a support group. My colleague Miles Briggs paid tribute today to his co-conveners Monica Lennon and Rona Mackay for the last six years' work, but stressed that the situation has been going on for far too long is unacceptable and hopes that today is the start of something new. Pam Duncan Glancy outlined her own experience and quite rightly is very angry for both herself and her constituents. We've heard this afternoon that chronic pain affects one in five Scots, a hugely significant number of people needing access to NHS services. Often unseen, the long-term long health condition can be debilitating and it can interfere with every facet of someone's life, from work to raising a family, to socialising, to carrying out day-to-day -day activities and trying to get a decent night's sleep. As colleagues such as Emma Roddick has emphasised, there are mental health implications with the psychological effects of prolonged and often unpredictable pain, further affecting someone's quality of life and well-being. 
For some, the situation is so unbearable that they consider suicide as a way out. For many sufferers, it's more, of a, more a case of managing the pain they're experiencing than resolving it completely. And that often means self-management, and that isn't always the most appropriate pathway. The personal cost of chronic pain is extremely high, but so too is the economic cost. Jackie Bailey says the implementation plan is light on detail. She describes that GPs are struggling to cope. Patients, she outlines, are tra having to travel to Bath and now Doncaster for treatment. Pam Duncan Glancy said that people are waiting years for follow-up appointments. Rona Mackay said it's, that the that it, data is sadly lacking and it is vital to have that data. And Minister Mary Todd actually said that she is aware of the gap and needs to get the appropriate data in order to manage the situation. Across the UK, millions of workdays are lost due to chronic pain conditions and especially mus musculoskeletal problems. Finley Carson outlined the impact of people who drop out of the labour market and some people are, are waiting for three years for injections. Sickness absences in Scotland's NHS are also often related to musculoskeletal problems and we know how important it is to ensure safe staffing levels as the NHS struggles to cope with the level of demand. Presiding officer, chronic pain is a public health issue and it requires a coherent policy response. Dr. Gulhani outlined a chronic, chronic pain crisis and Monica Lennon outlined, outlined the code black in Lanarkshire. The number of people waiting for their first appointment at a chronic pain clinic soared by 50% between June 2021 and June 2022, from 2,576 patients to 3,853 patients earlier in the summer. Delays of not just months, but years, as we've heard today, have been reported for patients waiting to receive steroid injections. GPs are often the first port of call for pain sufferers, and understandably so. But many patients do not realise that they can self-refer to allied health professionals such as physiotherapists because the SNP's government's public messaging around primary care reform has been so poor. Bob Doris says that there's a plan now in place but it needs to be implemented and he's laid down the challenge to the government. The problem is that vacancy rates are, among, are high among AHPs, especially for physiotherapists and occupational therapists, the top two professions with vacancies that account for more than a half the total number of AHP vacancies. Yet another example of the S SMP's shambolic NHS work for, workforce planning. Presiding officer, chronic pain is a public health issue. It's, it's also a women's health issue with women disproportionately affected. The UK government's women's health strategy has stated the amb ambition that invisible or undiagnosed conditions where pain may be the primary symptom will no longer be a barrier to women's particip participation in the workplace. The SNP Women's Health Plan makes no such commitment. The UK government's women's health strategy also highlights that MSK conditions are more common in women and prevalence is higher in, in areas experiencing higher levels of deprivation. It sets out the work it is undertaking to address disparities in this area related to sex. The SNP Women's Health Plan fails to address this point. I'm especially disappointed that the Minister for Women's Health is responsible for driving the chronic pain implementation plan forwards, but only makes tokenistic nods to endometriosis in the document. Alex Cole Hamilton mentions members of the CPG for chronic pain being ignored and silenced. We've heard concerns today about the voices of chronic pain sufferers being silenced also by civil servants. Shocking incidents have been raised in the press about bullying and intimidation by officials directed towards chronic pain patients. Their voices and experiences must be heard. Gillian Mackay wants shared patient records. Christine Graham wants delivery on the ground. Presiding officer, the reality is that this SNP government keeps publishing flimsy policy papers and plans to improve our NHS services. On chronic pain, it's telling that in the 2008 report, getting to grips with chronic pain in Scotland, 
The then Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, Nicola Sturgeon, said, five previous reports on chronic pain services have been commissioned since 1994, each drawing attention to services that are inadequate and patchy. Dr Sandesh Gulhani has said the Scottish Government has a duty to come up with solutions such as training surgeons to administer injections. The SNP Government has an opportunity here once again to improve the lives of people in debilitating pain. Success will be judged by implementation, not intention. Thank you. Thank you, and I call on Marie Todd to wind up. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you too to all of the members who have taken part in today's debate. I hope to pick up on many of the points raised in my closing. The debate has provided us with a chance to highlight the impact of chronic pain and to reflect on the challenges faced by people living with this condition. We have also identified opportunities to improve care services and to support people better who are living with chronic pain. Specifically, today's debate has been an opportunity for us to update Parliament on our ambition to tackle head-on some of the long-term challenges faced by pain management services through the actions set out in the Framework for Pain Management Implementation Plan and to hear members' feedback on the, these commitments and their views on what else needs to happen to improve the quality of life for people with chronic pain. In the context of wider pressures caused by the pandemic, today's debate has reminded us of the importance of developing more sustainable and effective pain management services. I think Rona Mackay, amongst others, um, raised the issue around people waiting for um, injections. I absolutely appreciate how difficult waiting for treatment is for people with chronic pain, including those who are facing longer waits for injections and infusions because of the pandemic. The requirement for specialist staff and theatre capacity to safely administer these treatments meant that availability was impacted during the pandemic and health boards who offer these are continuing to work through their waiting lists as quickly as they can. As many people have raised, we are determined to learn from the experience of the pandemic and our framework sets out the steps that we are taking towards more consistent, evidence-based and sustainable delivery of these treatments. Certainly. Pam Duncan Clancy. Thank you. I thank the Minister for taking that intervention. Um, is it the Minister's view that pain clinics and pain services should be back up and running as before COVID, notwithstanding the waiting list, but should they all be delivering the services that they were delivering before COVID? Because I do not think that is the experience of my constituents. So I think there are challenges with that at the moment, and I will come on to some of the areas that we are reviewing and some of the areas where change is likely. But um, let me be absolutely clear that the NHS, whilst the rest of life feels quite normal and it feels in this chamber and it feels at events in the parliament like life is back to normal, life in the NHS is far from normal and the impact of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis is being felt on a daily basis in our NHS and we all are aware of the strain that the NHS is currently under. So no, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to demand that services were exactly back to pre-pandemic levels right now. We are determined to... Certainly. Monica Lennon. Thank you. Um, Minister, we have heard today that life is far from normal for people living with severe chronic pain. It is unbearable. Can I ask, are we getting a firm commitment from the government on the, the very reasonable ask for the data to be published for those patients who require follow-up treatment so we can get sustainable services, transparency and some certainty for patients. Minister. So certainly, I mean, firstly, let me be clear, Scotland's the only UK nation that regularly publishes dedicated service um, performance data for pain management services. Chronic pain services in Scotland, as I said in, in the intervention from Jackie Bailey, are currently unable to gather electronic data and return appointments in a consistent and robust manner, um, in one that could support, for example, the, NATA, the national data collection by Public Health Scotland. So we've committed to continue work with Public Health Scotland to increase national reporting and analysis of data to improve the services of chronic pain, and that indeed is a firm commitment in this framework. 
We are determined to improve care and support for people with chronic pain, and much of the work is already underway through the reforms and improvement we are delivering for our NHS. For example, we have increased funding to £170 million this year to support primary care services, to expand, expand multidisciplinary teams, provide additional pharmacists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists who can support people to better manage chronic pain and its impact. We are increasing the recruitment of mental health workers, including 365 additional posts and GP practices to ensure that people with chronic pain have access to local support for their mental health and well-being. We understand the links between chronic pain and other illnesses, including musculoskeletal conditions. We are tackling waiting lists for joint replacement surgery through our investment for of over £400 million in a network of national treatment services. And as has been mentioned many times in the Chamber today, I regularly meet with women living with endometriosis, and I understand chronic pain is often a symptom that they experience. That is why we are investing in research into endometriosis. We are taking forward work to implement an integrated referral care pathway to achieve earlier intervention, and we have developed new resources on NHS Inform to enhance access to information and signposting to support for this condition. Certainly. Very briefly, I wanted to ask specifically, we would put forward the idea of one stop um, injection and infusion regional clinics. Now, we know waiting times uh, for people are just unacceptable. If you're told you need an injection within six months, to wait another 18 months before a referral isn't acceptable. Could, could I ask if the government will actually genuinely go away and consider this and how that can be delivered? Minister. Absolutely. We are committed to delivering improvements in pain management services, including exploring options around regional collaboration between health boards where it's appropriate. But with regard to uh, interventions like specialist interventions, um, specialist interventions like injections and infusions, firstly, we need to agree a more consistent and sustainable approach to the provision of these treatments based on clinical evidence and patient outcomes. And work is already underway on that approach through the framework which we expect will deliver more effective care for people with chronic pain. As has been set out by members today, I mean, I'm, I, I think that the investments and improvements that we have already um, begun are making progress in, this in, in these areas and will benefit all patients accessing NHS Scotland services, including those with chronic pain. But as many members have set out during today's debate, more work is needed. And that's why we're pleased to have the opportunity to set out our approach and how our implementation plan will deliver meaningful improvement in care and services for people with chronic pain. While we understand that the majority of people with chronic pain access support in community settings, much of this debate has focused on the experience of people attending specialist pain management services. And again, we recognise that there are opportunities for improvement. As our experience of the pandemic has demonstrated, we need to promote new approaches to delivery so specialist services are more accessible and sustainable for the future. We will continue to work with service managers, our clinical networks and the Centre for Sustainable Delivery to introduce new ways of delivering care to create additional capacity and redesign pathways into specialist pain services. We have also heard today about the variation in management and treatment options across Scotland and I want to be clear that it's our expectation that every person with chronic pain has access to high quality evidence-based effective support to help them to manage the impact of their condition no matter where they live. Now self-management has been mentioned a number of times in this um, debate and I, I have to be absolutely clear self-management is part of all pain management strategies and that was highlighted beautifully by the contribution from Pam Duncan Glancy when she related her own experiences. It is absolutely not about choosing one strategy over another. Supported self-management is vitally important whatever strategies are being used to manage pain. As mentioned to Miles Briggs, we've, Miles Briggs, we've intend um, we intend to review the existing signed guidelines on managing chronic pain to ensure that they are up to date. We will also deliver, as Miles Briggs raised, the recommendations of the Prescription Medicine Dependence and Withdrawal Short Life Working Group so that people are supported through safer and more effective pain management strategies. I also want to specifically highlight the points raised today about the access and availability of specialist interventions for chronic pain, such as injections. Now, I understand how important these, patient, these treatments can be for people receiving them. And as part of our wider work to improve care and sustainability of services, we're taking action to develop a more consistent, nationally agreed approach to that issue. 
Now, together, all of these actions in our framework will provide a better experience of services for people with chronic pain, improved coordination of care between community-based and specialist services, and better outcomes for their care and treatment. As Minister for Public Health, I absolutely understand the importance of tackling the inequalities faced by people with chronic pain that have been raised in this debate, and we have to ensure that the services, our services reduce these inequalities. In my opening speech, I set out the many strands of activity that are underway to improve access to pain services, and alongside this, we're investing in improved use of local and national data. That includes the Scottish Health Survey, for which the first time it's collecting national level information on chronic pain and the wider factors impacting on people's quality of life. And that will help to inform the delivery of more holistic, coordinated services for people with chronic pain. Waiting times are a useful measure of performance, but as we've discussed in this debate, we can go further. We're also going to continue to drive innovation, building on Scotland's international leadership in pain science. We've engaged the NHS Research Scotland pain community to explore their priorities, and we will continue to identify opportunities to promote new approaches in our care and service. In closing, I want to reiterate that the Scottish Government, along with all of us here, are committed to increasing awareness of chronic pain and its impact. In ensuring that people can access the right care in the right place at the right time. Much has been made of, in this debate of the challenges experienced in the past, and that is why we are taking a new approach to ensure that we can deliver at the pace required. We are also taking a new approach to involving people with chronic pain. We are hearing from a broader range of voices which reflect the diversity of experience of life with chronic pain in Scotland. Lastly, presiding officer, I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to speak with us to inform our picture of what more needs to be done to meet people's needs. Their experience has been invaluable in informing our approach to date. It will continue to be invaluable as we take forward our work, ensuring this government does as much as we possibly can to support those living with chronic pain. Thank you. That concludes the debate on improving care and services for people with chronic pain. It's time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 6792 in the name of George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member is asked to speak on the motion. And the question is that motion 6792 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 6793 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on a stage two timetable. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now and I call on George Adam to move the motion. And moved, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 6793 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 6794 and 6795 on approval of SSIs. Thank you, President Officer, and all moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. And may I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Sandesh Gulhani is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Jackie Bailey will fall. The first question is that amendment 6779.2 in the name of Sandesh Gulhani, which seeks to amend motion 6779 in the name of Hamza Yusuf, on improving care and services for people with chronic pain be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.